First UKZN's Professor Moussa Mushabela, Mushabela, I beg your pardon, joins us from our Durban studio, as well as Professor Shaheen Mehta. She is from Infection Control Africa Network. She's live for us via Skype tonight. A very good evening to you both. Let me start with you, Professor Mehta, and ask you the question, how worried should we be at this stage? Uh, good evening, um, and good evening to your listeners. I, I don't think you should be worried uh, at all, and I know it sounds like I'm trying to uh, brush over. But in fact, this is the first case we've had of uh, coronavirus, and it has been an imported case. There has been no known local transmission taking place, uh, which is different to what one has seen in China and in Italy, for example. And if people come back from high-risk areas, then the chances are that one or two people will probably come back with it. The fact of the matter is, that we are very well organized, and uh, I, I belong to the, to, to the National uh, Working Group, looking at how one is going to contain this. And I can assure you that this is a team effort with the public. The public must have confidence, and we will uh, obviously make sure that we are transparent so that everybody knows what's going on and how best to deal with this. All right. Um, one of the reasons that we won't have a major problem just at the moment is because we are in the summer, and if you noticed, all the countries that have got a problem are indeed in their winter, which means that it is the flu season for them, and that is why the virus is more likely to spread in that environment. For us, we might have to look at another time of the year if we don't clear up the virus before then, so we might have a COVID outbreak going on here maybe in our winter months, but hopefully by then it should, be, it should have cleared up. Professor Moshabella, you are in our Durban studios. You're with UKZN, the University of KwaZulu Natal. That is where this first case of coronavirus has been confirmed. You've got a war room going on your campus. What sort of service are you providing to the campus community? Yeah, thanks, Tembegile. Um, our intention, really, uh, when we started this war room, which was before this case uh, was identified, um, was to make sure that we focus on awareness, making sure that people are well educated so that we can avoid panic, we can avoid um, disruptions and stampede, misinformation and so forth. And also try to get people used to the behaviors that are necessary to prevent the transmission of uh, COVID-19. And all of this we were hoping that we will do it in a scaled fashion uh, in a staged manner uh, and roll it out throughout the campus while we don't yet have a case of COVID-19. In the process, we're busy su doing surveillance, watching all of the cases that are happening, monitoring where they are moving, trying to track them, tracking the literature in terms of the evidence that we need to do to, uh, to have in order to manage the COVID-19 properly, and also making sure that we are putting together teams of experts uh, from in infectious disease, public health, from clinical virology, and now working also to strengthen the campus health services to try and make sure that they are well equipped, trained to respond to any case that is identified. We knew that our staff traveled globally, our students traveled globally. We need to monitor their travels and be able to know when there is a suspected case, be able to know how to screen for a case and be able to diagnose a proper case definition mm. and do proper tests uh, together with the authorities in the Department of Health. Uh, and I want to ask you on just the drive that you've had, Professor Mushabel, and I'll have, you, I'll have you also take a bite of this, Professor Meta in Cape Town, but I want to begin in UKZN and ask how you go about these information and awareness drives without causing any unnecessary panic. Yeah, um, our approach was to try and do this um, before COVID-19 arrives, when people still feel that it's not yet close to them. Of course, the diagnosis that happened today, the case that was identified today, changes our strategy. We now have to step up efforts and mobilize much faster, much more rapidly than we had intended to. We are having people in hospitals where the cases are located, students saying, do we need to stay here? What do we do? We are having uh, students in residences and staff concerned about what's going to happen. Clearly, parents are also going to express concern. And what we really want to do is to make sure that people understand with correct information when people know what to do and they're empowered to know what is it that they 
what role do they have to, pay, to play, then they will be able to feel more confident in navigating the situation. Okay. We are not there yet. I think a lot of the preparation that we have done has really been what happens when we detect a case. Professor Metzal, you were watching that briefing by the minister and as reflected in the debate on coronavirus in the National Assembly today and subsequent reaction just scanning through social media among South Africans, there is a degree of panic and serious concern. By your assessment, did the government do enough in informing and educating people about how the virus is passed on, the recovery process ahead of what we've seen today? Well, first of all, let me congratulate my colleague, Dr. Uh, Professor Shabalala, on doing a fantastic job uh, looking at the media. I think that is the key to this whole thing, because if we want to successfully control uh, coronavirus or uh, COVID-19, we have to do it jointly with the public. Um, I, I think it has been very useful for me to be working with the government and to see how well they have been all tried to get organized the best they can within the short time frame and the period they have. And I think personally they've done a tremendous amount of work. And I really need to commend the, the, the new minister as well as the team that's working, that they have had their finger on the pulse right from the very beginning and absolutely everything has been tracked. Um, as you probably know, I, I'm, I'm also working on the WHO expert group. And what we hear there and what we're doing in South Africa is very, very similar indeed. We are taking our lead from the WHO, sometimes from the CDC, but mainly from the WHO, with very clear guidelines. And they're very simple and very clear that can be probably done and, 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 and executed even in the smallest uh, clinic that we have in South Africa. I want to come so in there, Professor Mehta, and ask you another question. Apologies, I don't mean to cut you off for just racing yeah. against the clock. But I want to talk about the handling of this case. This man, we understand, the 38-year-old, who's now the first official case in South Africa, arrived back in the country from a trip to Italy. It may have been a vacation. Ten other people now need to be found by the health department. He seems to have, well, at this point, made it through airport control all the way home. He then reported to a doctor to, as presenting with symptoms. When you look at that, do you understand why there's an, a degree of alarm just about the detection of coronavirus? Well, I guess I do, and also I, I don't think it's unusual. I mean, in my years of experience, there will always be somebody somewhere who's going to slip through the net. But the, idea, but the fantastic thing that happened was that he self-isolated uh, and went to a healthcare worker, went to a doctor, who examined him, thought of corona, took the nasopharyngeal swab, and then self-isolated themselves. Now, that is good teamwork, and that is what the government teamwork should look like and what South African teamwork should look like. So even if we miss them at the port of entry, supposing they're coming on a private plane and we don't pick them up, they should feel responsible enough as citizens of South Africa to go to the proper health care facilities and to, and to say, look, I've been to a country that where there is exposure. Can, we, can you please do me a swab and tell me what my situation is? And that is the way we will control it. Professor Moshabella, in our Durban studios, I know your university, UKZN, had indicated it an availability to assist government as we deal with the cases of coronavirus. Have you been roped in? Uh, not yet, but uh, not myself personally, but uh, my colleagues, because I work with a team of uh, clinical infectious di disease specialists and clinical virologists, they have been engaging uh, the one team with the NICD and the other team with the provincial task team. Um, at this point, we haven't really been actively roped in, but uh, we know that depending on the caseload, right now the caseload is really low, Tembegil. Uh, it's one case, potentially nine other cases. Uh, the resources that we have will be comfortable to handle that. What, what we are kind of gearing ourselves up to is a situation where the caseload starts to increase. Because then that way we're going to have to leverage all of the resources that we have and we have to mobilize. And that's what we are trying to prepare our team for. And also in terms of complicated cases that may need to be managed elsewhere. Yes, we support clinical health services uh, as a university in the province. But really it is the province that is uh, the custodian of those services. And very quickly, Professor Meta, I want to end with you just on the issue again of the screening now that we're looking for the people who came into contact with the man in KZN, he went through an airport. So 
there may have been 10 people in close proximity to him, but at this point, it would somewhat be near impossible to find each and every person that he's interacted with. Am I correct? Yes, yeah. Um, I don't think that's the way one needs to go through contact tracing because that would be ideal, but that's really not the way it is because if you're going to look at droplet spread, you really need to look at somebody who's been coughing and sneezing uh, or indeed touching everything with their contaminated hands. So while it's impossible to get everybody at the airport who, for the time when this person passed through, at least those that were in immediate contact and were uh, uh, on the holiday with him, and indeed his wife and, and children and so on, they need to be checked and see what's going on. I, I just wonder, I haven't got the information, but I wonder whether his wife was tested and found to be negative uh, and the children as well. And that information should be coming through. And then that gives us an idea of what the transmission rates are with this particular virus as it sits. And Professor Moshabella, I know I said I was giving Professor Meta the last bite, but just to recap, coronavirus, highly infectious, but not necessarily highly fatal. It, is there a chance that that could change? Well, not in terms of uh, the, the nature of the virus itself, but it can change depending on a number of factors. One is, as uh, uh, Dr. Nilton mentioned, that it could be the weather. If that changes, that can influence its transmissibility. It could be also how close we are as people. It also basically how the precautions that we take. I think we can really influence the transmission of it by making sure that we take the right precautions to limit the transmission. The rest of it really is not necessarily in our control, but what is in our control is the things that we can do, including all of the preventative measures that we are talking about. But I feel that we are not talking enough about okay. it, unfortunately. Professor Mashabella, in our Durban studios, Professor Meta joining us via Skype from Cape Town. My thanks to you both. Thank you so much for being on Nightline tonight.